Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to the Spin It Social Hour. It is such a pleasure to be here with everyone today. My name is Stefan Kaplan, and I am a social media and visual strategist and founder of the Spin It Social Hour. Today, we are going to welcome an incredible photographer and educator by the name of Thomas Werner, and you are going to learn all about him. But first, I want to give you some details about me. So I started the Spin and the Spin It Social Hour. I started the Spin It Social Hour ba on a, uh, based on a labor of love because I was really concerned for our photographers out there when this pandemic hit. And I decided that when it hit, I was going to do something to make a difference. So I launched the Spin It Social Hour in the hope of getting their name out there more and letting everyone know more about them so that when this pandemic subsides, that they may have more exposure and you know them better. Because this has been a rough ride for everyone. And I sincerely hope that everyone out there is doing well. And I am really deeply sorry for anybody who's been affected by this pandemic, whether it's health-wise, economically, et cetera. It has been a very difficult road, but we will get through this together. So I have worked with the Pulitzer Prizes. I have worked with AARP. I have worked with the Jackson Charitable Foundation. And I work with Sri Srinivasan and his DigiMentors group doing live streaming and event planning around the world. But we are all grinding today in this day and age. And Spin It Social and Stefan Kaplan is always open for business. So if there is ever anything that I can do to help you with your social media needs, please hit me up and let me know. It would be a pleasure to work with you. Now, in order to keep the Spin It Social Hour running, I have a sponsor now. So I wanted to let you know about my sponsor and my dear friend, Emilio Pardo, who's a visionary brand strategist, is now the official sponsor of the Spin It Social Hour and his new show, which I am producing and directing called Real Talk Live from the Barn. Let's take a quick look. Real Talk, live from the barn, with your host, Emilio Pardo, at Pardo Vision on Twitter, and this week's guest, dealing with small steps to making meaning in chaos, is Dr. Christine Whalen from the University of Madison, Wisconsin, an author, professor, and speaker, and our special guest also is Dr. John White, MD, Chief Medical Officer at WebMD and Ann Herbster, a marketing consultant who you will love to hear her story tomorrow at 6.30, Sunday. And we hope you will join us on facebook.com backslash Emilio Pardo Vision and Twitter Pardo Vision. All right. So now that we got that out of the way, it is time to give Thomas Werner the buildup that he deserves. So that is exactly what we're going to do. Thomas Werner, co-founder of Ascended Creative, is the author of The Fashion Image, known as a Bible of fashion photography. He is an editor-at-large for IRK Magazine, a Paris-based fashion and culture magazine and website, and past photography program director at Parsons School of Design, as well as former national board member and New York chapter president for the American Society of Media Photographers. Thomas helped develop a media literacy website and resource center for UNESCO, and has been an instructor at the UN Education First Summer School. He has worked with the US State Department on cultural projects in Russia, where he has partnered with 32 cultural, educational, and governmental organizations to develop projects in 29 cities, including exhibitions at the Hermitage. His private collection of Russian photographs and artifacts have been exhibited internationally. 
Thomas currently lectures internationally on the topics of photography, fashion, innovation, and education. I hope you will join me in welcoming Thomas Werner. Hello, Thomas. Hey, Stephen. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me this morning. Oh, no problem at all. I'm glad you're here because I know you have been traveling a lot. And uh, my new name for you is The Traveling Man. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm in the middle of a, a road trip through the national parks. So. Oh, wow, man. Why didn't you? Come on. You could have fit me in the motorhome and the luggage. We could have done that. <laughs> Next I time. Love, I love traveling to national parks. Oh, my God. It's, it's one of my favorite things to do is be out in nature. So that's it's been amazing. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that slideshow because as I always do with all photographers, I take a lot of pride in putting together these slideshows through uh, uh, curating all of your work. And I wanted to make your slideshow special in the terms of that everybody knows you for uh, a lot of your educational work these days. A lot of people know you for your visionary, uh, your visionary strategy and founding Ascendive Creative and many other things, and uh, and a great educator who travels everywhere and is open to students everywhere, and I admire that so much. But I wanted to, I know you're all about just creating, like I am, so I took that to heart, and I went through all your work, and I put that together. So what did you think? Thanks, I appreciate it. No, it was fun to see. It right. is great to see. Uh, people forget photography has enabled everything I've done in life. And it's still greatest pleasure. So it was great to see. You. Thank you. Oh no, my pleasure. I learned so much. I learned so much about every photographer and every person I bring on this show by doing that every week because it really is a thrill to me, having edited, um, which I didn't even mention in my intro, that I'm a former New York Times photo editor of 20 years. Indeed. But the thing is that um, it gives me great pride to do that because I learned so much about you guys. You know. Yeah, no, it's fun to look at work. Actually, you one have, of my favorite things. You have done so much. I'm so in. I'm so in awe of so much of the work you've done, and and you're such an incredible educator. Well, thanks. That's very nice. Oh, no problem. So we're going to get right to it here. And uh, well, first of all, let me ask you: How have you been? How have you been dealing with the pandemic? And how's life treating you with all of this? It's been a rough road for a lot of people. <laughs> well, actually, the you know, like for everybody, the pandemic presented a number of challenges, of course. Uh, but personally, it became an opportunity to kind of reassess and develop a few things. So I launched a podcast at one point, Thomas Renner Projects podcast that's out. We do, you know, we've interviewed Eleanor Crucci and uh, who else? Miriam Santos who's photographed David Bowie and a number of artists and other things. So we launched the podcast. And then uh, as an educator, I realized the world has become flat in a lot of ways and higher education has become challenged yeah so i started to do a little bit of consulting and more consulting began to come in from around the world which was a really wonderful surprise and uh, a former ta of mine and i started to talk about how we could work and run classes in india mm. she ended up getting a job developing social media for a large fashion conglomerate in india Oh. And so I moved forward with Ascended, and it was originally just going to be a platform to kind of provide educational opportunities, and it it, it grew rather exponentially very quickly. Uh, so the pandemic actually has provided a time of real growth for me and a chance to reconsider. And there are yeah. things you can do now that you couldn't do six months ago or nine months ago. You know, it's so true. Um, you know, the whole spin at social hour thing was was founded based on my passion for social media and photography. But what it really did was it gave me the opportunity to move forward with something I've always wanted to do, which was broadcasting. And I really see I really see live streaming, as we talked about uh, a couple of times. And, you know, um, if I wanted people to know, you know, I recently met Thomas uh, back in January. Uh, for the first time uh, through a friend of ours in common, a great photographer named Aaron Lee Feynman, uh, who is a freelancer for the New York Times and many other places, and his beautiful wife, Nicole, uh, who works at the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And I think Nicole is still there. I believe she is. Um, but anyway, um, it was a pleasure meeting you because we've talked about this. And I really view live streaming as the natural evolution of social media because it helps to amplify social media and social media in turn amplifies the live streaming. 
So I think social media was hitting a bit of a, a little, getting a little bit stale in certain ways, beyond TikTok, beyond this, beyond that. And I think live streaming has enabled people to really, if they have it in them, to get out there more now with their voice, you know? People are looking for new forms of entertainment, new ways to learn, uh, right. people engaging online, of course, and listening to live stream in ways they weren't before. So I think you're right, right on. So the, the Thomas Werner Projects podcast, um, huh. tell me, tell us about it. And also, um, so for example, why did you go to podcast route and not necessarily the live streaming route? That's a, that's a, a pretty, you know, uh, well, good question for the moment, considering what we were just talking about. What we're talking about. Well, I decided to podcast because I'd been recording a, so I'm writing a book for Rutledge Press on the business of fine art photography or fine art photography. Okay. And uh, the manuscript is almost done. That'll be in and the book will be out. Uh, we'll announce that when Rutledge is ready. But uh, mm -hmm. so in part of, as part of that process, I was videotaping interviews with artists mm -hmm. and we were going to, I will use some of those clips mm -hmm. when the book is launched. Right? right. When I started to think about live streaming, I thought the location I was in, the quality, of the light, et cetera, wasn't quite what I wanted. It didn't match the studio style light that I had for the other work. Mm. So podcast made sense. And it was also really difficult to interview people. You do a great job with live stream, but to interview people long distance, particularly over Zoom in the beginning when it was glitchy mm. and have the kind of quality I wanted. So mm -hmm. podcast made sense. Uh, it did mean learning to learn meaning it did mean needing to learn the editing software, mm -hmm. which was absolutely brutal. Uh, and I think uh, it's been a really wonderful learning experience in terms of how I interview, in terms, like you say, of learning people's career. Mm -hmm. And I've had access to an extraordinary group of people. I drop one every three weeks, which I think is a good pace for me, mm -hmm. and, uh, given the other work. And yeah, I think that's the... I think that's the important thing is figuring out our pace when it comes to doing these things. Cause I don't think people realize how much work and the time that it takes to put together a weekly show. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, the, podcast I, is, the interview is the easy part of the podcast. Right. Yeah. Right. It's, exactly. It's, it's two people talking. Right? And editing and yeah, the rest right. of it's the work. This is right. The good and live streaming with this, you know, with this beautiful platform StreamYard that I've fallen in love with here. Um, I'm, uh, I love StreamYard and I'm a big advocate of it now is that um, the beauty of it is being able to put together these multimedia presentations, you know, and also feed it to Facebook. And we have people chiming in. Stefan. Hello, Stefan Falke, wonderful mm -hmm. photographer. Uh, you know, Stefan, correct? I do indeed. Yeah, okay. and, uh, he's going to be a future guest, by the way. We have a very special secret project we're working on. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll clue you in, though, behind the scenes. All right. And then, uh, we saw Tim Stone chiming in. Tim says hello to you and everybody. And uh, Pradnia Haldipur from uh, Silver Springs, Maryland. And a bunch of other people. So welcome, everybody, to the Spin It Social Hour with my guest today and my friend Thomas Werner. I am in awe of all the work that Thomas has done and all the travels. So I'm looking forward to continuing this for the next hour and really digging deep into his background and letting you learn all about him and his amazing educational experience. So you can take advantage of it too with him because he has so many projects. But first, let me ask everybody, please, if you're watching, make sure you share this broadcast with your friends, with your family even with your frenemies, okay? Make sure you share it with everybody because we want Thomas to get out there and we want everybody to know about him because he is a really great, great educator and photographer. So moving on now with the show, Thomas, how did yes. you get started? How did you get, by the way, you have a great voice on the podcast. Oh, thank you. You have a great <laughs> voice. Thanks. I mean, well, I, I did a podcast with some folks in Detroit, uh, a fashion podcast, a fashion cast podcast. They deserve a little plug. And they're really wonderful people. Uh, and they kind of opened the door to me to considering podcasts. Yeah, let they me said, oh, do this. Yeah. And so why not? Again, the, I've, what I've learned during the pandemic is why not? There are a lot of things you can do. Some things will work. Some people, some things won't. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. You need right. to be producing things. Um, oh, no, absolutely. So, so how did I get started? I'm sorry. In the no, you were I, starting. I, I, you get started. 
at what age and and if you know at what age and what you know when did the photography bug bite you and when did you fall in love with photography and how did you develop your career in photography uh, I didn't start taking pictures until I was in college and uh, my best friend Todd Lundin, uh we used to go on a lot of motorcycle trips together mm-hmm. and and we would go up into Canada and around the west and he said you really need to have a camera so I bought a camera and uh, we started to take pictures on the trips and I fell in love with it. It was amazing, but never imagined it as a career. Right. It wasn't until uh, I went to Los Angeles and got a job in casting. Uh, actually, I went to Los Angeles, ended up with a job. My first job after my degree was very glamorous. I was wearing polyester pants and a dicky saying, would you like pop? Would you like butter on your popcorn? Yeah. But it turned out to be in a theater that did movie premieres unbeknownst to me. So okay. I met some friends and it uh, turned out they were in casting and I got a job casting, you know, bit parts and music videos and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I went back to well, Wisconsin to bring my motorcycle out and did a lot of pictures and walked into a lab and they said, oh my gosh, we love these. Can we put them on the wall? Can we put them here? And I was very naive. Naivete has played a huge role in my career. Uh, naivete and uh, beautiful accidents, really lucky mm-hmm. mistakes. They have, they have shaped my entire life. I, and, I like that. Beautiful accidents. I like that. I like they, that. They really have been. And uh, so they put the pictures up. I was naive. I quit my job at the casting agency uh-huh. and uh, started working as a photographer. So mm-hmm. then the, the work was harder than I knew how to do. So I, I'd had a degree from University of Wisconsin. I went back to Art Center, College of Design in Pasadena and uh, took a started taking courses there. So I was running a business full time, a photo business while I was in school. Mm. Yeah. And then, and then, and then years later, I mean, amazingly enough, uh, which is, I wish I, you know, knew the gallery back then. I apologize for not knowing it, considering I used to gallery hop. Uh, you were the founder of your own gallery. I was another happy, beautiful accident. Uh, I had been going back and forth from LA to New York and I had a space that I'd been sharing in the Chelsea Arts building on 526 West 26th Street mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and took over the space as a studio It had been shooting there and then 9-11 occurred. And 9-11 actually changed my career in substantive ways. Wow. And your, well, I know. And uh, so I had a job for Carvassier in October mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. I didn't have anything. And as you know, a lot of the larger photographers were taking the work we had at the next level down because they didn't have any work either. The ones that stayed in New York who didn't go to Europe. So I'd help curate a collection for Swiss Re. Swiss Re had the top, built out the top six floors of the Helmsley building and I was an assistant curator on that, uh, art curator. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, I've got this space. There are a lot of galleries at 526. I'll open up a gallery. Mm. So I put friends work up and people came in. I thought, all right, why not? And I went to one of the directors of Paul Kasman Gallery, a big gallery in New York, and said to her, hey, I think I'm going to open a gallery. And she said, you can't do that. You don't have an art history degree. You've never worked at a gallery. And I said, well, open. <laughs> that, is such, that is such a typical like answer from like, you know, other people in, in, in the field, you know, that way, uh, you know, you don't have an art history degree. You don't have this and that, you know, sometimes you have to go for it and go with what you know, and you can create something new and great. Look, I, yeah, I never would have opened the gallery. I never would have worked in Russia. I never would have done any of the things right. most of them would have done if I followed those rules or listened to people tell me I couldn't. Right. Even as an exhibiting artist, the uh, work that I ended up exhibiting and was written up in the New Yorker at one point, I was the pick of the week and then a review for, you know, for four weeks. When I was at Art Center, I had professors, they looked at that work and they said, oh, that's really great. That's nice. But why don't you just put that in a drawer for yourself and don't show it to anybody? And a gallerist in New York saw it, well, what would it have been six years later? Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, you have to exhibit this. So there's a balance between who you learn from and how much you listen to them. And certainly a balance between what you try and the people who tell you you can't. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I, I'm, a, I'm a, go ahead. I'm sorry, please. I was just going to say naivete. I, I, had no, I had no idea how much work it was going to be to open a gallery. And it is absolutely the most fun and self-indulgent thing you're ever going to do. Uh, turning a, turning a profit at a gallery is, is a lot of work. And that was my promise was I would keep the gallery 
as long as it made a profit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, after 10 years, I had a lot of other things going on and it was mm -hmm. time to close the space. And art fairs were coming up, which aren't my favorite thing. Right, right. No, yeah. I um, I learned a lot about the gallery scene when I first had my first couple of exhibitions and uh, and museums too. And, uh, you know, it's it's a whole nother world. So it's, it's a very interesting world and very dynamic and very, very complex. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. But, you know, I, um, I saw this photo of uh, the fashion image. Uh, as I said, many people consider it like uh, the Bible of fashion photography now. Mm -hmm. um, I've read these things online. You know, it's, uh, it's what people are saying. And uh, must have been, uh, it's always a thrill, I guess. You know, you walk into the Strand or anywhere and you see your book, uh, you know, on display and everything. Uh, great feeling, huh? It was pretty amazing. I, I went into the Strand. I don't know, this is probably five or six weeks after the book was out and asked, I just want to see it on the shelf. And that's where it was. And the guy said, no, it's on the table. And I never expected it to be uh, featured. And it was a great, a great feeling. Um, my mom read voraciously um, and she, she would have been thrilled uh, that yeah. I'd written a book. This yeah. too happened by accident. Uh, uh, I got an email that said, hey, we're looking for somebody to write a book on fashion. Mm -hmm. you have an idea or do you know someone who does? Mm -hmm. And I had a meeting with the editor from Bloomsbury Publishing. The book is by Bloomsbury Publishing in London. Right. And she came in and we had coffee and I gave her three ideas. And she said, well, instead of writing three books, you should write the book. And well, let's put the them book. all together. The like book. It. And I was very naive. And I said, well, okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not, not realizing what that meant. <laughs> and, uh, and so how long how long did it take to put the uh, fashion image uh, together, Thomas? Well, the you start with a proposal, particularly for your first book, and that process you work very closely with your editor because they help shape it. Your editor really becomes your advocate. They take that pitch to the editorial board, right. who says yes or no. Right. So we worked for probably four months on the five four months five months on the. Proposal because it was sent out for peer review by two photographers in New York. I mean, not New York, in the U.S. and two in the U.K. Okay. And then once it's okayed, then my f the first book goes through four peer reviews. The next book will go through one, so it'll be much different. Mm -hmm. um, and the writing of the book took about a year and a half, mm -hmm. a little bit longer. And actually, licensing the images for the fashion image was tough because, you know, we we have some images from the Avedon Foundation, and we have right. a couple images from other photographers that are, are quite well known. Actually, um, Inez and Venud and Mario Sorrente, Kate Moss, Giselle all donated work to the book wow. because it was an educational book. Wow. Uh, and what many what thanks, That's great. Many thanks to them and other people who donated. Some people donated work to the project because yeah. textbooks don't have huge budgets. Right. And, I want to give uh, a, the, I want to give the author or the photographer, let me say. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I was I felt very lucky, but the licensing was uh, took a long time because yeah. we had to go through some agencies, some of which, like the Avedon Foundation, was right. extraordinarily gracious, right. and others who uh, made me negotiate for a month and a half or more. I wanted to give a big shout out to Ron Thomas of Strategic uh, uh, um, of Strategy Focus Group out of Dubai. Uh, Ron is watching from Dubai, so uh, he's based in Dubai. And he's a wonderful HR expert. There he is, Ron Thomas. Yeah. And uh, he's um, um, just, you know, doing so much overseas. And I met him uh, last year and became friends. And he's an incredible uh, photographer, too. He walks around Dubai early in the mornings on his walks to stay in shape. And he takes a lot of great photos in Dubai right now. Anyway, wow. greetings, Ron. And greetings to everybody else joining us for the Spin It Social Hour here with Thomas Werner author of the fashion image and we're looking at some of the work right here thomas beautiful work in this book I so mean, and it isn't and i should say all the work isn't in the book is not mine not remotely and that right. was a, an important choice right i felt because i didn't think it should be a book about me i right. also one of the conversations with the publishing company and for people looking to publish certainly photo textbooks and that kind of thing i think is important is early on i made the distinction that this is a photo book with 80,000 words of text, mm -hmm. not 80,000 words of text illustrated by photos. Mm -hmm. So the photos had to be primary and they had to be forward and they had to, I thought, carry the day. Mm -hmm. And that was 
a long conversation actually with the publisher. We had to talk about that and the designer a few times mm -hmm. because it's a very different way of looking at a, a text, a textbook as it were. And we removed a lot of the things that make it feel like a textbook because I wanted it to be interesting and accessible to students, but also uh, interesting to career changers and people in the field. And I do think we've achieved that. I mean, I really do. I think the book uh, is, I'm pleased. Right. No, well, you know, that's why one of the things I did, I made sure of, um, is that in the opening slideshow where people want to go back and watch it on replay, uh, all of those photos in the opening slideshow are yours. Uh, yeah. Be sure to specifically curate the uh, opening slideshow based on your work. And then uh, when we got into the slideshow here, the present multimedia presentation of the book, I wanted to make sure that uh, there was a clear cut division between that work and and a lot of the work that isn't yours because you know I want everybody to have their fair share of of uh, play and I don't want to step on anybody's toes in terms of rights and stuff like that so exactly. but anyway you know you have some great quotes in the book too you know like this one from Mario Sorrenti learn from a defeat and be able to come back with the answers i mean that that's i was thinking about that last night and it's so true Mario's one of actually the most decent and introspective people and well prepared. He still at this point researches the audience of every one of his clients in the magazines and really is is very humble in terms of his success. And I thought this quote was interesting too because he believes in coming back with the answers. And right. and even now he has things that uh, don't work out. You right. know, he was gracious enough to join me for the book launch at Parsons. We had 450 people in the auditorium and another 300 uh, actually who were on the list. And he was very open about the fact that there are certain magazines that his work just doesn't fit in. Mm. And one, one student asked, why don't you shoot more for American Vogue? And he laughed and he said, I don't know. That's a great question. I, I you know, so we all have our place, uh, even the most talented people. And he's extraordinarily humble and transparent about his successes and his challenges. I thought that was amazing. You know, it, it's so great when you have somebody of that caliber who is willing to lend great insight, um, share the experience, but yet be so humble and also, you know, down to earth with their approach towards people they work with and new people that they meet. Because, you know, it, it's just, that's how life should be. It shouldn't be the other way where there's all this other nonsense that goes on. But I threw this photo in here, by the way, for a very well-known uh, photographer for The Wires, uh, a good friend of mine who was actually my first guest on this show. Uh, huh. And this is the, by the way, folks, this is the 25th Spin It Social Hour. Um, I didn't make as big of a deal as I did online about it when we opened today. But it's pretty cool, and I'm pretty happy. And uh, you know, I've gotten a lot of great feedback from all the photographers that have been on, and it's a pleasure to have Thomas on here as on as the 25th guest. So I picked this photo because Nick Curry, who is in in Monterey and doing amazing and very dangerous work with the wildfires out there, uh, for the wires. Uh, raises chickens. <laughs> so uh, I, I threw this photo in there because Nick, this one's for you, buddy. <laughs> so a prime, yeah, fashion photo, a prime fashion photo with some beautiful chickens. And Nick has a chicken that looks just like that. <laughs> you can't have too many chickens. And Paul Gilbert is the photographer. I should give him a shout out. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. So this is a beautiful photo. I mean, I love the setting. I love the the whole concept. Um, and, you know, all of these photos in the book are just, you know, just so gorgeous there. The picture they're, on the right actually is mine. Okay. Uh, that was a fashion shoot we did at the uh, Ten Bells pub in London. It was the pub where Jack the Ripper's last victims were last seen. And uh, okay. it was closed and we were going to tear it down. We were able to get in and shoot before they destroyed the pub. Wow. Uh, it was an amazing day. Yeah, it was a great day. Wow. Uh, so what did it feel like walking around a pub that you knew Jack the Ripper was like? It was a little intense. It was it was seeped. But I love those moments. You know, that's what we do. It's yeah. seeped. 
And uh, no, no, no doubt. I mean, it's a it's a really great photo, and uh, you know um, the quality of you know the quality of fashion imagery uh, among some of the best out there, and even even others always amazes me because you have to be so on point with fashion photography for the quality, for the galleries, for the magazines, for the uh, exhibitions, you name it. And uh, you know, I worked for years at the New York Times, as as everybody knows, and. Um, you know, I worked with some of the greatest ones, you know, including Bill Cunningham, who was, you know, is yeah. anybody, any, if anybody, if anybody doesn't know Bill Cunningham, please Google Bill Cunningham and, and go see the documentary based on his life, which is an amazing documentary and learn all about Bill because one of the great photographers out there and not just a fashion photographer as Bill always, you know, said because bill documented life it wasn't just fashion fashion is life and life is fashion right <laughs> it's true hey and i i do want to say i sorry i'm not giving props to everybody but the the image on the left is by a collaborative called french cowboy out of paris and me and julian are also the editors who started irk magazine the magazine that i write for and work as an editor at large mm -hmm. so they're another example of people who are amazing image makers. Uh, Julian designs uh, graphic design and product design for Prada and leading brands in Paris. And then they've also started this fashion print and web publication. So I want to give them a little shout out too. Okay. Hey, I'm going to ask you, so here's a question for you, Thomas. What is the difference between a normal fashion photograph and one that becomes iconic in your opinion? And what do you look for to make that decision? as somebody in this business that's very well regarded? <laughs> well, I think there are a couple of things. First, it needs to be technically sound and it needs to speak both technically, stylistically and content wise to the time in which it's created. So really great fashion images looking back become arbiters of the time in which they were made. They become kind of definitions of that era. So if I say the 1960s or the 1990s, you get a vision in your head, but frequently a vision, that vision includes the fashion of the times. Mm -hmm. And I think a great, great iconic fashion image captures the essence of that moment and who we were socially, morally, economically, mm -hmm. uh, subculture, right? If you think of times like punk versus disco, they both, both images of both those forms of fashion defined who we were at the time, right? Yeah. People yeah. punk were rebelling. Uh, you know, against what was deteriorating New York and London and lack of jobs and people in disco celebrating indulgence and, and acceptance, really. I think people forget that uh, places like Studio 54 and in the late 70s, ideas of uh, sexuality were very broadly accepted and openly discussed. Uh, you know, David Bowie was gender fluid. He slept with Mick Jagger, who was with Bianca, who was with, right? And so... These, these, this topic changed, of course, the conversation changed with the advent of AIDS, but I think it's important to look at different areas and understand how the ph photograph defines it. And then, well, you know, there are a lot of great photographs that don't get visibility and traction. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, no, it's true, you know, I, visibility, right? It, you can create an iconic photograph that doesn't become iconic because right. it, yeah, it doesn't get the visibility it deserves. Well, right. And you need to know how to get your work out there. And that's one of the things that we're going to get into uh, in terms of your experience and your expertise. By the way, I have a great uh, friend I grew up with, roller disco skating. And by the way, I worked at Studio 54 for two years. Oh, uh, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, worked, I, I was a bus boy. <laughs> I love uh, it. I worked at Studio 54 two summers in a row while I was in college. And uh, man, if only I had a camera in my hands back then, man. And uh, <laughs> they should, they're very lucky that smartphones didn't exist back then. <laughs> oh, well, but that allowed a lot of life to happen. Uh, yes, it did. And uh, I got to see it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's, an, it's an experience uh, there and working at the Paradise Garage for a summer. Uh, wow. And I, I actually have my club membership card to prove it. That's great. Um, Two places with amazing sound systems, but also, wow, man, life! What, what, what an experience that was! Unfiltered, 
unfiltered with fashion and sexuality and you name it. It was amazing to uh, be a be to bear a witness. You know, uh, I almost said to be a part of. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't well, go there. Yeah, yeah, we won't. Right. We won't talk about the role you played, but we will. <laughs> but, Let's stop but right. Heard, Let's stop I right heard there. stories. But it was, you know, that was an amazing moment. And I think people forget you had fashion, art, music, literature, everybody, really film, everybody came together at a place like Studio 54 and also collaboratively, yeah. right? It was a moment of an extraordinary collaboration. And I think prior to that, it was probably the dietists, surrealists, the fashion designers, the movie makers, the, you know, Stieglitz's, Stieglitz's and, and then I think you're in that moment now. And, and I don't think that, young image makers understand that, that you have the chance now to work in, you can write, you can create film, you can curate, oh, uh, you man. can shoot, you can, do, you can be a photo editor. Elizabeth Renstrom at The New Yorker is a great example. She's published a photo book, she shoots, she's a photo editor, she was the editor at Vice. Yeah. Um, she, she's a great example of somebody who's breaking those contemporary boundaries. So if you're, if you're listening and you're creative, Take advantage of all these things. It's a oh. moment where those things are celebrated and that won't last forever. It never does. Wow. See, that yeah. it that is the advice that I wanted to bring you on for because you know and you have the experience and the wisdom to teach everybody and tell everybody out there through the Spin It Social Hour. And I'm a big advocate of that. You know, right now is, you know, with everything that's going on, even there's opportunity to create and learn from and just go to and take your work and your thought process and ideas to a new a new level, a new dimension. You know, yeah, I think part of it's letting go of past constructs and not the ways that photography or, you know, video or reaching audience is going to change. I don't think, you know, television's going away. I don't think magazines are going away completely. I hope not. But, I hope but not. you have the opportunity, though, to, if you're willing to adjust or be flexible or create and innovate a little bit to engage the world in new ways. Absolutely. And, uh, our, friend, our friend Stella Kramer, who you know, uh, Stella, who was a colleague of mine at the New York Times and was actually part of the Pulitzer Prize winning team on the Portraits of Grief book. Oh. And uh, we were on a show last week with Sri Srinivasan uh, re recounting our stories about 9 11. Wow. And uh, Stella just launched a wonderful uh, new uh, uh, um, uh, magazine called uh, Stella Zine. And uh, the wonderful part about it is that she's really finding work that just has not gotten to play out there and she's going to start putting it out there that way. And, uh, you know, people can subscribe to it at Stella zine, uh, that's Stella and Z I N E. So Google it. Um, and, uh, anyway, one of the things I want to say was I had a friend, have you ever heard of Bobby Miller? He did a book on studio 54. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of photographers out there, so it's possible that you haven't, but yeah, Bobby, I Miller, I interviewed Bobby. Uh, he was in like around guest number 15 and, okay. uh, he was an old roller disco friend of mine. He had cameras in his hands everywhere. He went back in the days and amazing. got some amazing fashion and other photos at studio 54. He did a whole book on it. So, I'll take a look. Yeah, yeah love exactly. it. Bobby Miller, Bobby Miller. So, so let's um, let me bring on somebody, a good old friend of mine who actually uh, worked in some of the clubs with me, and also is a very talented photographer. His name okay. is John Quincy Lee, and uh, um, John is a great old friend, and he does a lot of uh, fashion work and concert work. He wanted to ask you a question. Sure, Hi, John. Hey, hey John. how's it going? Good morning. Good morning, morning. you. Thank you, you for coming. Good? Hey, yeah. Hey. Okay. Hey, um, I was asking, uh, as um, digital photography is taking over, and a lot of camera companies, uh, I, I think this they stopped making film cameras. Uh, in fashion, is everybody going to go digital uh, uh, eventually? Yeah, I, I think so. Well, not everybody, right? The majority of people will. And the majority of people will for any number of reasons. One, a lot of shooters are shooting digital, they, they were raised on it, they love it. Uh, a lot of companies want a faster turnaround. They wanna be able to be participatory, whether in the shoot, sitting at a video village or in another location, they wanna see what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, you'll have a handful of clients and a handful of photographers from time to time who can shoot film um, and 
perhaps uh, want that look or are willing to be more indulged in terms of timeline expense. And really it's, it's the time frame. And for some clients, it's trusting an image maker in a way that they don't anymore. Mm -hmm. So when everybody shot film, you know, you had a little magic happening because the photographer could create things that not everybody was seeing and you had really beautiful accidents that were considered after the fact and you didn't have a team of people perhaps managing the image mid process, yeah. which I think takes away some of the creativity yeah. with all due respect to the amazing art directors and, and uh, photo editors that are on set and creative directors, mm -hmm. but it, you know, chance there's, there's less chance. So yes, I do think the major vast majority of work will be digital. And in rare instances, you'll be able to shoot film. But when you talk about feel, when you look at a picture, could you tell the difference if it's a uh, film or digital? these days? I think, I think there's, well, I do think there's a difference. I think there are some images you can't tell, you know, there are some images that look like transparency film that are shot digital, almost the same, not the magic on the light box, but they feel the same because of the crisp edge and the color. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can do some amazing black and white work, or you can do some amazing color work with, I think a different, very different grain structure than you get uh, digitally. And uh, the edges are a little softer and the feel, the, there's a depth to that silver. So I do think there's a difference. Um, not always, you can't always tell, but yeah, if you do a spread in, in film or that's what you shoot consistently, I think there's a different vibe to your work. And let's face it, you're probably more considered if you're shooting a roll of 10 frames or 36, you're gonna be more considered with each image and uh, that changes the look. Okay. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, right. well, thank you. everybody, look up, look up John Quincy Lee. Uh, that's Q U I N uh, Q U I N C Y Lee. John Quincy Lee. Check him out on Instagram. John, thanks so much, man. It's so great seeing you, man. We got to catch up. One, uh, you know, social distancing wise or not, I miss you, man. You got it. I got a picture of you right behind my shoulder here. <laughs> <laughs> Is that me with the big mess on his on his chest? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Not this guy, but the. Yeah. the yeah. Those are the Studio 54 days, right? That's uh, yeah, that oh was my, uh, <laughs> uh, actually this are Roxy days, Keith Herring. Huh? Yeah. 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 John John Lee was Herring. there. Yeah, well, Stephen was Stephen was there. Yeah, John. Yeah, John was I used to hang out with the Roxy back in the days, and we had some great times. All right, John. Okay. All right, take okay. care, buddy. See you later. Take Thank care, you. Guys. Thank on. you. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye. So John's a really, really solid photographer and he's always working. So he had, you know, he wanted to come on and I appreciate it. Yeah. So there's Stefan promoting Stella, Stella Zine. There you go. I love it when people share. Um, so let's see. Uh, one of the things I wanted to also ask you was, um, we have it right here. What is the most important advice, uh, Thomas, that you would give uh, young photographers out there today? Well, I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> One is, I don't think the business is as difficult as everybody's going to tell you. Okay. I think that people who are just starting out understand uh, the consumption of imagery across multiple media platforms and internationally in a way that uh, a lot of photographers who've been in the business a long time don't. And with all due respect to many of my colleagues, they just, they don't approach it in the same way. Um, there, you know, young image makers are used to working in video and still and creating for Instagram and creating for print and they don't think anything of it. They understand the platforms and they understand the language. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say embrace that. I would also say, uh, as many people would embrace your creativity, uh, don't let fear rule your choices. I think uh, fear is absolutely uh, one of the great destroyers of great artists and great artwork and keep people from making the things they can make. Mm -hmm. uh, listen to advice, but trust yourself. Mm -hmm. And you need to work harder than you will ever imagine. And the whole, uh, the things your mom taught you or should have, you know, that you need to work hard. Um, when I was shooting fashion, I was, I work seven days a week anyway. I love what I do, but you know, it's a seven day a week, six day a week gig. Right. You need to you need to be deeply referenced, um, not just fashion. But you need to understand design, fashion design, photography, great film. You need references. So yeah, work hard, reference deeply, and uh, work fearlessly. 
Okay. The great advice, great advice and insight. Thank you for sharing that. So uh, as we're going to go through a bunch of slides here, because there's so you have done so much, I need three hours to interview you. But uh, we're going to make it all fit up to the uh, quarter past uh, 11 hour, which is usually what I go to because it's never, never did. The bodies of work that photographers that I bring on here is so important and so great that I never rush and I always make sure I get it all in. So as we go through this, though, I'm going to let you talk a little as I show a bunch of these rather than get into details of each one or else we'd be here till next year. Is um, that uh, do you help? To, so the, a lot of these are promotional posters and other things for a lot of the lectures you've given around the world from China to Russia and things you've curated and uh, other things. Do you help design these yourself? Uh, is it a partnership? Uh, and as I scroll through this, if you want to give a really great, um, you know, summary of a lot of the work, some of the work you've done, please just roll with it. You know, I didn't design. I didn't have anything to do with the posters design in China. Okay, uh, this was actually just prior to uh, COVID in uh, November of last year, mm -hmm. and uh, I did two gigs in China. The first one was. But 12 lectures in six cities in seven days. Mm. And uh, I spoke at in individual art schools, private art schools, and a series of universities. Yeah, this is great. They had these giant posters on the wall, one in English and one in <laughs> Chinese. The audiences were wonderful. Uh, I spoke on fashion and the fashion image, which was really nice. Uh, the folks in China were really gracious, and I enjoyed it. You're, it a, rock, a, you're a rock star, man. <laughs> It was fun. It is fun. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, uh, working in China, I think, provides a lot of opportunities. People don't begin. I think you can work internationally almost as easily as you can work nationally. Mm, OK. OK. Um, the next poster, the one on the left, Soviet life, Russian reality. I have a either the largest or second largest private collection of original Russian historical photography in the country. Wow. And, yeah. And a lot of it uh, never published. And this was a, a poster for an exhibition done at a museum in Minneapolis, a Russian museum. Mm -hmm. um, my work was in two of those exhibitions, one of which uh, we had a floor. It was, I have to say a quick story. As a little kid in the Milwaukee Art Museum, there's a wing where the work was all donated by a family. Okay. And I would see from the question of, I remember being like, you know, the tag was right here and looking up at it. And I thought that was so amazing. So we had this exhibition uh, with a really gracious and, and, and talented collector in Minneapolis. And I had to give an artist talk upstairs in the main gallery and I asked right. to go to the bathroom, went downstairs and I stood for a minute in front of those tags that said from the collection of Thomas Warner. And 10 year old me was just so happy because <laughs> it was something that uh, I'd always wanted to do. So it was, a, it was a real gift. And I love the work. I started collecting it because it was being destroyed people didn't view photography from that era as artwork. Well, so. you know, that is fascinating to find out. Um, I know all the, a lot about a lot of the work that you've done, as we talked about, I've done my research, but I did not know that you had the largest collection of, uh, second largest. Uh, yeah, one of the, probably the second largest in the States, yeah. That's, private. Amazing. that's amazing, wow. Um, 18, 1900 pieces. Wow. And, you know, the other thing that I really admire, Thomas, about you is that you're the consummate educator, you know. So, you know, everything that you do, in my opinion, uh, from my observing all of this and learning so much about you, is you're always about educating. And uh, I saw that, you know, you have you always incorporate some way uh, you always find a way to incorporate students and mm -hmm. student bodies into what you're doing abroad and here. Yeah, you know? exactly. Uh, like this, uh, where you know people were able to participate in this other project, uh, and you had a, a beautiful poster design for it and everything. Uh, this is a stunning uh, advertisement here for uh, um, the uh, exhibition that you curated uh, the state at the State Hermitage Museum, the General Staff uh, Building. Uh, what an amazing image here! Yeah, well, at the Hermitage, uh, that was a we collaborated together for seven years right. and then did the best of exhibition that toured uh, of all the work. And actually we were the first university to have a formal contemporary photography exhibition at the Hermitage. Okay. And we were, I think the third contemporary or fourth contemporary photography exhibition at the institution. Uh, it was a great time to start there. 
when I started working in Russia, that's another story we can get into later, but uh, it was if, if you want and, and how that happened. But it was a uh, contemporary photography really was something new. So speaking about the idea of concept and context was groundbreaking. Right. And it was a great time to be traveling. I've been to 33 cities there and with 29 different governmental educational and uh, other cultural organizations. I, I am literally in awe of the amount of, of projects that you've worked on and also the ability to do them all so incredibly well. I mean, your, your touch is on everything, I can tell. And um, you have a real gift for being able to manage all of this because this is a, a lot of lot of projects and a lot of curation and other things that you've done. So hats off to you in terms of the excellence that you provide out there in the photography field and the education field. You know, and these these are all what you're seeing are posters from uh, from the Hermitage and other exhibitions internationally. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I wanted to get a bunch of them in here to show the design elements and yeah. the, the beautiful design that goes into creating these. Um, and it truly is, a, a, they are works of art. You know, I found this photo amongst your travels because I go snooping everywhere. And uh, it's one of the fun things is to find photos that just come out of nowhere. And I, I love to throw them out there to my photographers and educators and other people that I bring on the Spin It Social Hour. This photo just, to me, spoke about so much. First of all, the, um, the, uh, the, the, train uh, conductor, uh, not conductor, uh, personnel uh, across the way there in the other train in Russia. Um, yeah. I believe it was in Russia, correct? Yes, yes. She's dressed like a flight attendant. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. What, a, what an incredible outfit and what an incredible, you know, contrast between the couple sitting in the front with their map. It looks like, a, oh no, actually that's a, just a table uh, blanket, a uh, table cloth. And uh, tell, tell us about quickly about, about this photo. Where were you going? Well, I tr I've traveled extensively in Russia on, by train, and, and it's a lot slower way to travel, but I, it it's, it's, uh, it's ranges from frightening to enchanting. Uh, and this is a coupe, which is four people to a, a cabin, a very small cabin. Right. And the thing about coupes is, is kind of the people on the bottom control the table, and the people, I sit on top because I don't want to be involved most of the time. And uh, but people come in and out of the coupe 24 hours a day because they get off the train, get on the train. So you never know who you're going to wake up with. Um, That's the fun I've part. Had, I've had some interesting, yeah, and frightening uh, partners and some really wonderful people. My, I, I can speak Russian, but I'm not fluent conversationally. Wow. So. Uh, this was a couple. They were very, very nice. She was putting her tablecloth on the table because many people, particularly from the Soviet era, travel very prepared. And mm -hmm. she had a bag of food. You realize people bring full meals. And even if it's a short, which short, six hours is a short ride on a Russian train. And uh, yeah, they were quite delightful. And I spoke my, my mediocre Russian and it was pretty great. So we... We did that. Uh, they let me take the picture, and I saw the conductor on the other side. It just, it just worked. Oh and yeah, no, that, 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 that her, her in the middle there just made the photo. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, on her phone or on her walkie-talkie or whatever it is, a great photo, a great moment. And here's some more, um, uh, more curate, curatory um, projects you worked on, and also uh, other exhibitions. And I didn't know you even lectured. Boy, you've lectured everywhere, man. Even my alma mater, Baruch. Um, I found this and I had to give a shout out to my alma mater, Baruch, because I got you a did. great education at Baruch and um, I met my guiding light there, Rosalind Bernstein, who's the founder of the uh, Sydney Harmon Writer in Residency program there. Hmm. And uh, I should introduce you to Ros now, even though she's retired. She does a lot of great writing surrounding the arts. So I'll, I'll introduce you to Ros. I think you two would really have a lot to discuss. That'd be great. Yeah, she was my guiding light, man. She set me on the path to journalism and and photography when I wanted to go to law school. And she was like, Kaplan, you have to go. You have to go into into journalism. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, uh, after the law school exam, I decided to go into journalism because that law school exam was a doozy. <laughs>
It's rough. Well, Frank Rocco and uh, the ASMP New York put that together. I was able to keynote that, which was nice. Yeah, no, big shout out to AS, uh, ASMP uh, in New York and uh, nationally. Um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, so tell us about um, IRK Magazine and the work you've done. And one of the things I want to touch on here with them is this incredible COVID-related project that went on that I was struck by because I didn't know about it. And I really went into it last night. And it was amazing to me because, you know, I teach, I'm an adjunct professor at FIT, and mm -hmm. I know you've taught at Parsons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was my first time teaching last semester. And I have to tell you what an incredible transition it was to go from having the first six weeks in person and all of a sudden COVID hit and we were thrust into online teaching. And I felt cheated because I didn't get to know my students for the whole semester before we had to do this whole online thing. But it worked itself out, and I actually had five of them on my show as my guests. And uh, oh, that, was a, that was a great hour. I'll share it with you. Uh, it was uh, with my FIT students, and it was wonderful to have five great young photographers on. But tell me, tell us about IRK and tell us about in specific what you do with them and also this um, pandemic project that took place on isolation and fashion. Sure. Uh, I work as an editor at large for IRK, which allows, honestly, uh, allows me to write in, in a way that I haven't uh, otherwise. So I, I have the ability to photograph for them and haven't at this point. Me and Julian are amazing and allow you great creative range. Uh, and in terms of writing, I generally get to pick uh, the people I, I speak with. Although me and Julian have put me in touch with people like uh, the uh, couturier for Schiaparelli. Mm -hmm. So I was able to interview the, and there are only 16 couture houses in the world. So I was able to interview the designer for Schiaparelli, but I wanted to meet Erwin Olaf. I always have. So I pitched a story on Erwin Olaf and I got to interview Erwin. Uh, there are a number of stories like that that I've been able to write. I did a great story on Shay Dattar, who's an amazing young artist out of Los Angeles. And you can read about her creative process, which is, which is I think, appropriate. She also was very kind of transparent, mm -hmm. I oh. think. So RK has offered me access which photography always has but rk has and it's offered me the chance to write and kind of create and collaborate with people that i wouldn't otherwise i'm very very thankful for the opportunity okay. uh, and the creative freedom i look at, i love places that give me creative freedom and yeah. i create those spaces for myself if yeah. if they don't exist like you and spin it and uh that's great so the isolation portraits yeah. conversation came up uh how do we, how are people in fashion dealing with the idea of isolation in the pandemic? Mm. And how do we put a spin on it or how we bring it together and allow people to create? So we sent a call out to readers and we sent it out via social media as well. And then we reached out to a number of uh, PR firms and influencers and other people. So we had influencers like TK Wonder who have a million and a half followers, you know, large influencers. We also had a couple of former students. We have fashion designers mm -hmm. uh, and and readers who all did portraits of themselves styled. So the, the idea was you had to style yourself and take a portrait or someone take a portrait of you. And it had to be created during the pandemic. And well, we had an overwhelming response. Wow. If you look at the story, the work is quite gorgeous. Yeah. And the creativity is amazing. And we could only show a fraction of what we received. Yeah. No, you know, when I, when I saw this, uh, the photo second from right, from top right, caught yeah. my eye because I recently had Jennifer McClure on. Yes. Uh, and Jennifer is an amazing fine arts photographer, as you know, yes. um, internationally known. And uh, Jennifer worked on a major project. Uh, you know, she's a new mother at 45 years old. Um, and she, you know, then the pandemic hit all of a sudden. And she was isolated at home as a first time mom with a new baby uh, and many other things going on. And she took it upon herself, as she's done many times in life, to document things, being the fine documenta documentary photographer that she is. And that photo made me think of her body of work right off the bat because she was recently uh, had a big feature in Vogue online mm -hmm. about her uh, documenting this uh, uh in isolation 
and all the things that came along with being a new mom under COVID-19. Well, her work is quite gorgeous and very honest. And I think the photo on the right that you're talking about probably resonates. It's it's a very yeah. honest image. Yeah. And I think the emotional quality and the, the quality of the light, yeah, you, you connect with it as you and do. Jim. I can't say enough about, you know, uh, the other images as well. I mean, some of them are just beautiful. That black and white photo, uh, the uh, the semi-nude down there with the shades, just gorgeous. Oh. Savannah gorgeous. Spirit yeah. is uh, the artist, yes. Well, yeah. Who is Savannah it? Savannah Spirit. Savannah Spirit? Yeah. 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 Wow. So Savannah, uh, amazing, beautiful, beautiful image. That 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 belongs in in a in a museum in and of itself, right there. Um, and look at, I mean, you know, go to IRK magazine and do a search for a pandemic and isolation and uh, photography, and you'll be able to find these isolation fashion photographs. Dig into them. Some incredible work here, folks. And uh, let these photographers know, you know, that their creativity and their work is appreciated. So I wanted to talk about that, but I wanted to bring up Edward Leskin's question, if we can, Jonathan, because Edward's a big fan of the show and he's had several questions. I want to make sure we acknowledge him. Edward is a future guest, too. He does amazing work with Lycus in Pennsylvania based around the steel factories and stuff. Yeah. Well, so we're going to have him on. And in traveling and working in other nations, in particular those that make the headlines geopolitically, Russia, China, do you feel your exchanges and ideas in art are important on the larger scale, promoting cooperation and peace between cultures and societies, Thomas? Yeah, truly. And I, I guess the thing I have to say up front is I've traveled extensively, I mean, really extensively around the world and particularly in, in Russia and other places. And I don't find the disdain for the U.S. that I hear regularly echoed through social media and other places. There have only been a handful of people in the world that I've run into that I've, I've had uh, dislike the U.S. And, and sometimes that's envy. Uh, you know, if you offered, if you offered a, a large percentage of the people internationally would, would love to be here for the opportunities we have. And mm -hmm. uh, I just think it's important to say, I think we're a little caught up in a, a negative social loop and uh, we begin to forget, as I've realized driving cross country, the amazing people and places we have. So in terms of working internationally, and I've, I, I have to be honest, I've done a lot of work uh, supported by the United States Department of State. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they've funded uh, quite a bit of my travel and work. They've never asked me to say something specific or dictated what I should say or do. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, I think the engagement one on one, whether it's the arts or individually, is essential to that dialogue. And one reason uh, there's a bridge project that you may or may not have shown the poster for it. I think you did. We uh, that was a project where I had young people in 20 cities around Russia. And so I traveled to 20 cities and then cities in the US create videos about their lives and lifestyles. And then we shared them online and uh, there was a dialogue about them because you find there are a lot of similarities and a lot of differences but those differences are often easily bridged. Uh, meeting people one-on-one, -on -one, not just sharing the imagery, but traveling and talking with people one-on-one, -on -one, I think makes a huge difference. Huge difference. You know, politically, uh, we're all, is it's cliche, but we're people, and the majority of people are very decent, and a lot of people love to create. But when you get to a place like Russia or China, mm -hmm. uh, those the people who are creating there are, are challenged in different ways. and. I have to say, I have the greatest regard for photographers who created during uh, the Soviet era because mm -hmm. there were so many rules about what they could or couldn't make. And they made work that could have easily landed them in jail. And I know people who were thrown out of the country, just literally arrested and sent out of the country that evening without right. telling their family or anyone. I know people whose studios were burned, uh, who were regularly arrested because they photographed nudes or they photographed... Well, from the wrong floor, you weren't allowed to photograph above two stories because right. that could be spy stuff. I mean, so and these these people found a way. They didn't have chemicals, so they made their own chemicals. And, right, right. Uh, well, now with digital, you know, uh, yeah, it, now with digital, it's changed a lot. You can only imagine uh, what it, you know, what it was like back then, like you said. But these days, you know, just what you're talking about brings to mind how difficult it must be. And, I'm, and we know there are photographers that are doing this and hopefully they're, they maintain their safety, but in places like Saudi Arabia and many other places, you know, doing documentary type of work, 
I'm sure is in many ways, uh, it's certain types of work is very, very frowned upon and, uh, and can put people in danger there as well, you know? Well, and I think we forget here in the States, we feel very indulged and we are protected and allowed to do, despite the complaints, allowed to create a lot of work. Uh, censorship in any form always frightens me a little bit. And yeah. Oh, yeah. I think when I take students abroad, one of the things I need to explain is in certain countries, if you're arrested, it isn't like the president flies over and gets you out. <laughs> uh, and you can be arrested for any number of things. And women's yeah. rights aren't protected in the same way. And yeah. and it and what you create and what you put into the world in certain countries, you need to be aware of because right. it can get you in trouble. So you need to find a balance between trying to affect social change and understanding and respecting local cultures and histories. And that is one of the balances working in the arts internationally. Right. Um, right. There's there's a great great example. Uh, Nike has a swoosh. They have a series of clothes that are LGBTQ. So I don't talk about that, but I put up this rainbow swoosh and I ask the audience what they think of it. Mm. And somebody says, well, it's a rainbow and it's great. And somebody else says, no, that's uh, for gay rights and the audience debates. And I don't say anything. I just show the image. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we've had the conversation. But if I put it up and said, Nike's promoting a series of clothes for gay rights, I would get arrested and the thing would end and the conversation would never happen and people would be angry. Right. So there's ways to engage audiences that engender certain conversations. Uh, mm -hmm. But you need to be aware that when you travel internationally, I think. It isn't, okay. you, it isn't just stating your opinion. Okay. Well, let me um, bring on uh, my, my co-producer who does so much behind the scenes, and I want to acknowledge him, number one. And number two, he has a question for you, too. So welcome, Jonathan Borstein, my, my hey, buddy, my colleague, my partner in crime here. And uh, Jonathan, a few words about yourself and then your question. And very stylish, might I add. Thank you. Uh, I am a uh, full-time planner, a uh, sometime writer, a part-time tech. Um, and I think my uh, question uh, is basically uh, involves how fashion photography has sometimes mixed with uh, uh, other forms of photography or informed other forms of photography. For example, Maplethorpe uh, took fashion photography and mixed it with uh, fetish photography. Do you see more of that, less of that? What do you think of it? Well, I think it's where some of the best image making happens sometimes, right? When we blur those lines and the language of fashion is often appropriated like Maplethorpe did when he created the flowers or the nudes or, or some of his other work. I think that uh, young image makers find less boundaries and create more freely. Uh, they're less apt to learn some of the technical skills which need to happen but they're far more comfortable appropriating the language, visual language or photography and applying it in other places or taking the language of fine art and applying it in fashion or commercial photography. Right. And that's not just image makers. I think creative directors, art directors, editors, uh, they're looking for ways to stay contemporary because there's just so much imagery being made. Right. And you asked, somebody asked earlier, what becomes iconic? Well, part of that's being of the moment. And I, I think there's less of a fear of that now uh, than we had years okay. ago. All right. Well, Jonathan, thank you for coming on and asking that question. And thank you for driving the car behind the scenes. We really appreciate it. All the comments, all the banners, everything else. Um, it, it, if it wasn't for you, I probably would be like this during the show. So <laughs> it's great to have a co-pilot. Thank you, Jonathan. You're Thanks, welcome. Sean. All right. So speaking of iconic, um, there's a perfect segue into the fact that you've also been a great interviewer out there who has interviewed some of the most important photographers of our lifetime, uh, including who I've met once. I had the honor of meeting in his apartment uh, yeah. on the Upper West Side, Bruce Davidson. Yeah. Yeah. Year, years ago, but to tell a quick short story, I was working with the Life magazine of Japan, which was pretty much called Asahi Graph Weekly. And they gave me a 10 page spread on my NYPD photography back wow. then. And a young journalist came here from Japan and we worked together and he had to interview uh, Bruce Davidson. So he said to me, um, Hideto was name, uh, poor uh, Hideto, rest in peace. He passed away of cancer. Hmm. But um, he brought me along. He said, would you like to, uh, Stefan, he said, would you like to meet Bruce Davidson? I said, uh, let me think about that. Yes. 
<laughs> so I went with him and I met Bruce Davidson. But anyway, getting to you and your work here of interviewing such an iconic and important, uh, one of the most important photographers, some would argue, in our lifetime, Bruce Davidson. Tell us about working around somebody like that, interviewing him. And also, and also I'm going to get to, of course, Bob Jackson, that was who, photo who photographed the... Um, the uh, moment that Lee Harvey Oswald was shot. Right. And, and, you, and you got to photograph him too. This is your photograph. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Bob's a great guy uh, as, as is Bruce. And I, I was able to interview Bruce in his apartment, which is an iconic, amazing place. He has that oh photo, photo lab in the back. He has his own wow. dark room where he's done everything. And uh, it's like walking on hollowed ground. Isn't it? Bruce, yeah. Bruce was just very, a very, sweet and introspective man who uh, these both of these were for irk for Irk magazine so mm -hmm. uh, an example of company kind of access and absolute pleasure it is to work for them it's the uh bruce is very gracious uh, we talked for about an hour and a half and he told stories uh, he answered every question one of the amazing things about bruce is the depth of his process oh. and how he believed that time was essential to creating these things, you know, whether you're talking about the Brooklyn gang, the first image where he hung out with this gang of young kids in yeah. Brooklyn or the civil rights movement, which he worked on for years. People don't realize he was there for the marches. He was arrested regularly. Yeah. I think these are stories that aren't told and particularly now, it'd be wonderful to have some of these stories on earth. He was a, he was at the front lines. He, he put himself on the line. Uh, they actually took him and, had him go to LA for a year mm. uh, to photograph Los Angeles and car culture mm. and go back. He went back to the civil rights movement. I think he needed a little bit of a break. Yeah. Um, an amazing, amazing. I saw his dark room. I saw his, yeah. his whole, the filtration system he has for the okay. air and everything else. And, and uh, what a, what a nice man though, too. And uh, his wife yeah. too, just a yes. beautiful, a beautiful couple uh, welcomed us with open arms into their apartment. Uh, one of those classic Upper West Side apartments. Giant. And, uh, I'll never forget the moment. Right. I can't believe that I sat there with Bruce Davidson and I didn't have somebody take a picture of me with him. But you know what? I was talking to somebody the other day, and actually it was Jonathan, uh, my co-producer, and talking about sometimes these memories are just better in your head. You know what? Yeah. Not everything has to be in a picture. You know. True. That's true. And yeah. uh, but getting to this next uh, interview you did with Bob Jackson and photographing him. Where did you photograph him, by the way? This was in his house in Colorado. Colorado. Uh, OK. I worked with the people at the Ed Adams workshop and the Pulitzer right. folks to host the 100 year anniversary of the Pulitzer Prize at Parsons. So we had the auditorium. I, I don't know how many Pulitzer Prize winning photographers were there. Right. But the two was in the pre and after party, but the pre event uh, was like being in a room full of unicorns and legends. I was just so happy. I know. <laughs> and in awe, you know, yeah, you've worked with these folks. So I met Bob and, and uh, he told a little bit of his story and I asked if I could interview him and actually drove out to Colorado to do it uh, or flew out to Colorado and drove, drove to his place. Well, look and, at that. Look at that portrait, man. I mean, wow. I mean, I just, you look into those eyes and then you realize those eyes saw what, I mean, wow. I mean, well, he was in the motorcade. He was in the Kennedy motorcade. He was three cars yeah. behind the president. Yep. He saw the rifle go into the window at the book repository. He, uh -huh. he, he and the other photographers, he said he saw the rifle. Uh, he wasn't sure what happened. Uh, he hopped out of the car and he wasn't allowed into the book repository. And then he ran up on the grassy knoll and then, Ended up, uh, he and I think some other photographers. I'd have to, I'd have to remember that exactly. Mm -hmm. Got somebody to drive them to the hospital, mm -hmm. and uh, the story regarding the the photo, the shooting of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Right. You know, he was. He tells it. It's so interesting. He was a news photographer. He was on the day that the president was there, and the president said he didn't want the bubble on the car, the protective bubble, because he wanted right. the people. Right. He was off the next day and just on the day that Oswald was being taken out. Yeah. And I won't go into the story. It, it is in the article if you want to go to IRC. And uh, yeah. there's a link, I think, on my Instagram or my Facebook to the, the article mm -hmm. if you want to read it. Yeah. Uh, 
but he tells the entire story of how Oswald came out. He's been friends with all these folks afterwards. He's learned right. a lot about what happened. Right. Uh, the story was very insightful, and he and his wife were very gracious hosts. And again, a little bit of photo history magic. Uh, yeah, I love. I, I just this photo, this portrait, just draws me so in, and I love the way they played it right. in IRK magazine, so tight. And his eyes and 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 the just beautiful tone to his face. Wow, man. I mean, this is the type of portrait that just is, in my opinion, you know, legendary as is the photographer, you know? Um, but, you know, you've worked with so many. I mean, we could go down the list here. Uh, you know, Chris Buck, you've interviewed and uh, the, the great work he's done around celebrities and everything. Um, but you've also done a lot of work with different organizations around the world. And I wanted to touch on that briefly because we have about, you know, we're almost there, but I wanted to touch on some of the work briefly. And then we're not leaving without getting to Ascended Creative. So everybody knows about that. But in, in a nutshell, I mean, which is hard to do, talk, talk to us briefly about your work with the UN. I was able to teach at the United Nations Education for a summer school for three years. And each year they brought between 78 and 92 students uh, from around the world to New York to mm -hmm. study. Mm -hmm. And I talked to them about creating visual narrative and how to influence people and change minds and how to message, not to change minds in a propaganda way, but how to, you know, these were very socially conscious uh, people. And they were selected out of 14,000 applications each year. It was an, an amazing group of people. Um, one year, there was a, they had to come up with campaigns and I assigned them ideas so they couldn't fall back and do the things they were working on. They had to come up with something new. And one group came up with something not so different. And if you go back to the uh, slide, the Zoom slide, uh, that so the the middle slide was at the workshop we would do workshops and mm -hmm. we combined people from cultures and countries that didn't normally work together mm -hmm. and they found out that maybe perhaps they're not so different so they started right. a thing called not so different and i along with uh, rosie camden who's uh, uh i don't when she's hardly an activist but she's a woman's rights advocate in in right. cameroon who does right. extraordinary work she's award-winning came up with the we became the leaders of this this is the senegal chapter okay. and senegal is the leading chapter they host events and it fight the idea of not so different is to fight uh xenophobia and to fight ideas preconceptions about who people are and how they live and to promote acceptance and equality and uh opportunity internationally well, so we have i believe and rosie would be the person to speak to this i think we have 14 uh, groups right now internationally and we cover most of Africa. And, you know, you do your work uh, just in little bits. It's what you talked about earlier. You engage or the question. You engage people, yep. empower them, and you affect, I think you affect social change on the ground. And it's a slow occurrence. Well, that's but, well, that's one of the one of the beautiful things about social media when done right is it's bring, it can bring so many of us together. And you know, uh, I'm going to give a big French shout out to my uh, to my friends in Senegal and Cameroon and everywhere else. Bonjour tout le monde, mes meilleurs vœux pour uh, pour cette année. Okay, <laughs> uh, I wish everybody well for the new year uh, coming up, and uh, we all need some well wishes right now. <laughs> so anyway, Peter De Silva is joining us from a clear. Did he say a clear sky, California? Well, that's good news. Wow. That is good news. That is really good news. Peter's doing extraordinary work out there along with all the photographers in California, and we wish them well. What a what an ordeal out there in California, one of the most beautiful parts of the world. And oh, it's just heartbreaking what's going on. But thank you for telling us all about the United Nations work with UNESCO and uh, everything with uh, all of these countries. And look at all these wonderful students being able to participate, uh, thanks to UNESCO and you. Well, and this is, I should make, this is the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations and uh, the United Nations Alliance, okay, United Nations Alliance of Civilizations Education for a Summer School. That's one group. I've, I managed the creation of a website in five languages, French, uh, English, Russian, Arabic, I can't remember another language. Wow. Anyway, for, the, for UNESCO and the United Nations, that was a different, a different project. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. It was a no, no. It, they just both deserve their their shout outs. Oh, cool. uh, the other one was a media literacy website uh, internationally, and this was for the summer school. These groups of people, okay. so they were all for the summer school. 
Okay. The website was for UNESCO. Okay. I put it, I, I, I did as, uh, I, I did extensive research, but I may have missed one or two finer points. <laughs> but an amazing group of people. I have to say just some of the best, best times. Well, you know, I went through a lot of your work and I'll just quickly scroll through the rest of these here so we can get to uh, Ascend. But, you know, I just love all the camaraderie and all the wonderful photos I found of you with all your students. You know, students love, yeah. students. Lo a lot of students love to get to know their professors and uh, you are certainly no exception to the rule. Uh, I see it in the joy in their faces, in the uh, smiles and the warmth in their body language. And uh, I love I love all these photos. I wanted to give a quick glimpse of them and everything. But one of the things I want to do now, after we've talked about the podcast earlier, yeah. um, I wanted to get to your latest venture. Uh, we'll have seven minutes to wrap this. But Great. I wanted to talk to you about quickly, let everybody know about Ascend, Ascended uh, Creative and what you're doing and how people can learn about Ascended Creative and and uh, and have their education designed for them. Yeah, well, the goal the goal with Ascended, we provide a series of mentors who are at the top of their field. So Emmy award winning producers like Marie Baltazzi, uh, right, and and Milka, who was the who just came on board. She was the creative director at Snapchat. That's Maria. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you do is, as you showed earlier, you choose your mentor or you choose your course. And the mentor, you choose your own start date, and then you and the mentor set the time of day and day of week you want to learn. So I like it. One on one, you get to network with people at the top of their industry. Mm -hmm. You get to do what I think is decreasingly taught at many universities, and that's learn from uh, learn not only how to be creative, and you learn some theory, but you learn how to apply that in the field, okay. and you learn a lot of practical knowledge, and. Uh, when you can talk with somebody like Maria or Milka or, or uh, Julian or Mia or Danielle Pierce, there I can't go through the whole list, but right. these people in person, you really learn a lot, and and uh, we're able to create individual nuanced courses. So they're one on one, ten week or twelve week courses with a mentor. F. Scott Schaefer, uh, photo photographer who's worked with sort of LeBron James, Zuckerberg, uh, President Obama. Wow. <laughs> any number of any number of individuals, celebrities, uh, ad campaigns. You can work one on one with somebody like Scott. Learn lighting. Learn how to learn how to be on set. Right. A lot of young photographers don't know set protocol or how do you work around a celebrity. Sure. What are the ex expectations? Wow. What a what a what a fantastic learning opportunity to be able to pick your mentor, pick the course, pick the learning setup, whether it's in a group or individual, be able to pick the mentor of your choice, like Scott Schaefer here. I mean, wow. I mean, look at that photo of LeBron. I mean, talk about an actual gorgeous work of art. I mean, I recently had Jeffrey Salter on, who's an amazing, amazing photographer, done a ton of Sports Illustrated and many other projects with Brad Smith, um, yeah. uh, who just founded Brad Smith Creative. And I have to tell you that uh, this is an amazing, amazing venture that you've launched here. And to be able to learn from people like even, uh, talk about this one here, uh, yeah, French Cowboy. I mentioned them earlier. It's me and Julian. They're also the editors, the founding editors of RK or Irk magazine. Mm -hmm. And as a collaborative French Cowboy, they're extraordinary fashion photographers. They're risk takers. Uh, they love the love ideas of beauty, and they really do make a difference. Um, and so you can learn from somebody like that right. how to work with uh, a uh, magazine, but you also learn how to risk take and how to work technically and. Uh, how to how to produce things. I really, uh, we have small workshops of eight to 12, mm -hmm. and then that we're gonna launch in a rolling basis that are less expensive, but we also have workshops, the individual courses uh, that we host as well. And you, as you said, it can be one person or it can be up to a group of 10. All right, I'm sorry, a group of four. No course is more than four. Okay. And it's only a group if you decide you wanna do it. So we work with small businesses and we work with uh, individuals. And in this time where people are stuck at home in COVID internationally, right. it gives students a chance to connect and learn and build their careers and, and individuals to build their careers in ways they wouldn't otherwise. I think also in a time where universities are challenged, with all due respect to my colleagues and the places we've, we've taught and both taught, right. uh, 
you know, I, uh, a lot of students don't want to be in an online class of 12, 15 or a right. hundred. Sure. You know, it's different if you're in a group of three or four or one on one. Right. And we can actually provide that uh, for people. So perhaps somebody's uh, doing homeschooling and they want to build their career and they want to learn something new. Well, Senate provides that. Uh, we really, I'm hoping we can fill a gap that needs to be filled. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, the mentors go down the list here. I mean, from I mean Wilkie Lau here to to um, Daniel Pierce, yeah. um, and you know the list goes on and on. Julia Podiat, uh, Scott mm -hmm. Schaefer that we listed before, right there. Um, you know, so check out Ascended Creative. It's really a new online learning opportunity built for you. And uh, and a way to uh, I love the way you describe it as a boutique uh, learning experience, because that is really what it is. Uh, being able to formulate what you want to learn with who you want to learn and how you want to learn it. Wow. I mean, that's that's a great idea, Thomas. You can go to master class and you can watch a video or you can speak to that person and learn from them directly. And right. I think that's the kind of thing we're hoping to build on. Uh, well, find find Thomas uh, Thomas's Ascendive Creative at ascendedcreative.com. It's right there at the bottom of the screen. Also, be sure to check out um, Thomas Werner Projects on Instagram. That is Thomas's Instagram feed. And um, I have to tell you, I hope we covered it all, man. <laughs> I think we did. Thanks. It's been great. It's been a great, great interview and a great hour and a half discussion. Uh, it's been a social hour and a half today. Uh, but one of the things I want to do right now before we go, and I'm going to wrap up with some promos, is more important than the promos right now, is I wanted to acknowledge the, the passing last night of, oh boy, okay. Um, I'm going to choke up here a little because it's that important of a moment of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one of the um, true heroes of our lifetime, in my opinion, um, the great equalizer, as, is, as she was called here. I love this portrait uh, in the Atlantic uh, that was online last night. And I just wanted to acknowledge her passing. And um, I want everybody to take a deep breath today and know that we will get through this but uh, we all must do our part. That's what I, all I will say right now. I will also acknowledge Estra Suarez, a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer and very good friend of mine who was on the Supreme Court steps last night taking uh, some incredible photographs. And this one really struck me of uh, this person holding out their smartphone, taking a photo of this sign with candles that said, thank you, Ruth, we won't let you down and we won't. Uh, and also um, uh, Nick, Otto, uh, I found this online last night. I wanted to give him a big shout out for this photo out of San Francisco. Uh, we won't let you down, RGB. Look at that crowd last night. Everybody masked up, but outside to show their uh, their love and their admiration for Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg, please, mm -hmm. uh, on the streets of San Francisco. And whew, wow. Man. <laughs> Yeah, it's wonderful. To show, to show this photo here um, from, oh, my God, I forgot to uh, make a banner for it, but it's from, um, I'm trying to, it's on, uh, it's online and it's in the uh, uh, New Yorker, I believe, on their section uh, last night of Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg hu hugging uh, President Obama. That photo says it all right there, folks. Um, so uh, rest in peace, Justice Ginsburg. We'll do you proud. And then I just want to close out with uh, my photo of the week that I've let slide for many weeks. But I found this this morning. It was take, and I needed to see this this morning, uh, as many people did, of a beautiful moment in time that um, Gary Hershorn, who is a legendary photographer here in New York and New Jersey, captured this flock of geese flying over the Statue of Liberty uh, with that beautiful sunrise. Thank you, Gary. A lot of people needed to see such beauty this morning after such a hard evening. So Thomas, um, on that note, I'll leave you with a note of beauty rather than a note of, uh, of sorrow. Um, 
you know, it was a tough night last night, but I wanted to thank you for being on the Spin at Social Hour and telling your whole story. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, we rise to challenging times, right? We will. We will. And we have to. So um, hang on behind the scenes for a minute. Let me wrap up. And I'd just like to have a word for you, as I always do with all my guests, if you can. Sure. And, and I'll let sure. you go. But thank you again. And everybody, uh, a good big hello and uh, goodbye, rather, to Thomas. And I'm going to wrap up here. So hold on, Thomas. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, everybody, this has been an incredible hour and a half with the Spinet Social Hour and Thomas Werner. But I wanted to quickly wrap up and tell you that next week I have the Spinet Social Hour with two amazing photographers that I developed. I, um, I came about to know through a neighbor of mine, uh, Holly and Jim Soul. They live in Rhode Island and they are travel enthusiasts and photographers. And uh, they travel around the world. And in my opinion, their photos are Nat Geo worthy. And I can't wait to bring them on next week. Uh, when I first approached them, they were like, you want us on your show? I was like, absolutely. Their photos are unbelievable. So join me next week for the Spin It Social Hour for uh, the travel photography of uh, uh, Jim and Holly Soul. Amazing photographers. Also, please... Tune in uh, tomorrow to the NYT Read Along with uh, guest host Neil Parak, Sri Srinivasan's baby and Neil Parak's baby. Uh, we read the New York Times Read Along, all of us, uh, every Sunday together, like a bunch of crazy people, as they like to say. But uh, tomorrow's guest is with Susan McCormick, U.S. President of United Way Worldwide. And Neil Parak used to be with United Way, but he is now VP of Digital and Comms for Digi Mentors, who I proudly work with um, part time, and it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, always working with Sri and Neil and all of us together, doing live streaming around the world. And then finally, uh, also sign up for Sri Srinivasan's Fundamentals of Social Media at Muckrack Academy. That's mrack.co backslash social and get social media certified with my colleague and one of the foremost experts in social media and digital out there, uh, former CDO of Columbia, former CDO of the Met, former CDO of New York City government, and many other things, Sri Srinivasan's uh, Fundamentals of Social Media at mrock.co. It's free, by the way, backslash social. And then finally tomorrow, join in for She's On Call, Sundays at 11 a.m. with Dr. Sujana and Dr. Marina, uh, talking everything health, COVID, and many other things. Join in, She's On Call. And please, tomorrow, join into the show that I'm the executive producer of and also the director of Real Talk, live from the barn, 6.30 tomorrow with Christine Whalen, Dr. Christine Whalen, Dr. John White, and Ann Herbster, our guests tomorrow. Please tune in 6.30 tomorrow online at Emilio Pardo Vision on Facebook and Twitter Pardo Vision. And once again, folks, I wanted to say thank you for joining me. What an incredible experience it's been with Thomas Werner. Have a great week. Um, take a lot of time today to, re to reflect about Justice Ginsburg and everything that we're dealing with right now. And I'll say it straight up, two things. Mask up, everybody, and please... Get out and drive the vote and vote, okay? This is our lives and our lifetime that we're talking about here. And make sure you do your part and uh, make sure the process works for us all, okay? Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great week and be safe and be well.